Persona 5 is a game of many themes. Individualism, youth, and friendship are all centered at the very core of the game, yet no theme, I feel, is more prominent than that of rebellion. From day one to the final boss, the game makes sure that the player feels the trademark anger and passion that leads beneath any rebellion, big or small. We see this concept reflected in many aspects, from the bloody awakenings that represent a rejection of modern societal norms, to the ousting of powerful abusers and criminals at the highest levels of our society. However, I would propose that Persona 5 seems to have a specific bone to pick, with one of society's oldest and most traditional methods of control, which is of course, religion. More specifically, Abrahamic religion. Now at this point, I'm obliged to disclose that for the remainder of this video, I'm going to be speaking about religion and how it is viewed by the game. Of course, I harbor no ill will towards those of faith, and I hope that everyone can understand that this video does not stand as a hit piece on Christianity or any other religion, but rather an exploration of the themes present in the source material. However, if all of that sounds like something that you would rather not engage with, then this is your official notice. Moving right into things, in order to understand what Persona 5 thinks about religion, we need to first understand the religious symbols in the game and where to find them. For the most part, our religious symbols can be found mostly in the enemies that we fight through the main story. Shadows and demons take various forms, and most of these forms are all derived from some historical source, whether it be mythological, classic literature, or biblical in nature. Now, these biblical personas are obviously held in high regard, as they are mostly relegated to powerful and uniquely dangerous enemies. There are a select few that appear as lower-level demons, but on the whole, biblical personas are very strong. For an example of this, the Persona Archangel is the second mid-boss that the player faces in Kamoshida's Palace. So from some of the player's first encounters, we already see a large holy figure directly posing a threat to our goal. Now this mid-boss is significant, because Archangel sets the precedent for more biblical personas to follow. From him, we begin to see shadows based on the Bible as highly powerful, both as enemies and as recruitable personas. It is also no coincidence that the personas chosen for the final mid-boss rush before the fight with Yaldabaoth are all important archangels from the Bible. Now at this point, you may be thinking that there are personas from the Bible that aren't mid-bosses, and you're exactly right. While every single Christian-themed persona may not be a boss, they each seem to hold a large amount of strength for their level. Now this isn't a hard rule, and it has its exceptions, such as Angel. But for the most part, personas like Power or Principality are strong options when you're first able to capture them or fuse them. We also see a large number of biblically themed personas come up as strong endgame options. Personas like Metatron and Sandalphon are powerful summons that are capable of learning some of the most damaging almighty spells in the game, such as Megidolaon. So all of this tells us that these Abrahamic personas are all very powerful. But what does any of this have to do with Rebellion? The thing about these personas and demons is that they're all positioned specifically to be under the direct control of Yaldabaoth. Not only that, but they're also positioned as significant threats to Joker's progress. As mid-bosses, these personas occupy a slot above that of a regular enemy, and as such, they receive special treatment. For example, in the mid-boss rush where you fight all of the Archangels, each is given a brand new name, one that is perhaps less than charitable. Uriel becomes the Herald of Death, Raphael is now the Cleanser of Heaven, Gabriel is the Declarer of Anguish, and finally, Michael is the Apocalyptic Guide. These names all insinuate some sort of malice or ruin, as if they are meant to be a twisted interpretation of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Now before you finish writing that comment, yes I know the Four Horsemen actually exist as personas in the game, but they play little to no part in the story, and as such they can be ignored from a thematic standpoint. Now, furthering this, these four angels are all positioned as guardians gatekeeping the route up to the ultimate evil in the game, Yaldabaoth or the god of the masses. On its own, these details may seem like innocuous choices, but when you put the pieces together, a larger picture becomes clear. It's no coincidence that the holy Abrahamic personas are all seen as powerful evils stopping the progress of Joker's Rebellion. And from this, we can surmise that Persona 5 views religion as a uniquely powerful and devious means of control over the masses. This viewpoint may seem uncharitable and a bit much, but historically speaking, it isn't exactly wrong. Religion has always, and will always be in some form, a method of control. And Persona 5 apparently takes issue with that. But let's say that you're still unconvinced. How can I be sure that Persona 5 has such a negative view on religion? To that I say, look no further than the protagonist himself and his personas. Joker is a symbol of rebellion, and as such he fights against all of the corrupt means of control that he confronts. And what persona is more analogous to Joker than Satanile? Joker summons Satanile as his final persona, and it's widely thought to be his true persona, if such a thing could exist for a wildcard user. 
Putting things literally here, at the end of the game, the player summons Satan to shoot God in the face with a demonic revolver literally called Sinful Shot. I really don't think things can be much more blatant than that, and as such we can understand from all of these choices that the demonic and satanic aspects of Abrahamic lore are stand-ins for the concept of rebellion, and isn't that just so fitting? In a modern context, the use of Satan and Satanic personas as code for rebellious beliefs is a perfect fit. Historically speaking, in the Bible, Lucifer was the first angel to rebel against God. In fact, many pious individuals believe this to be the first ever instance of rebellion in all of time. But in today's cultural zeitgeist, the image and nature of Satan have morphed from an entity in the Bible to a more large-scale revolution against classic religious beliefs. The modern-day Satanic Church is almost a comical rejection of the less appealing aspects of Christianity, and they advocate for things like secularism and science rather than draconic biblical law. Extrapolated to Persona, this is relevant because whether you love it or hate it, Satan has become an icon of rebellion and individual freedom which falls right in line with Joker as a character. We see that Persona 5 has taken this into account and made sure to make many ties between Joker and his hellish personas. Personas like Satan, Beelzebub, and Lucifer are some of the most powerful in the game, and they do well against the more holy mid-bosses you fight, reinforcing that theme of rebellion. I hope by now all of this religious talk hasn't scared you off, because I don't write this with the intent to talk badly about religion or make people into Satanists or anything like that, but rather I hope to display the excellent codification of rebellion through modern cultural symbols. I know that nowadays it is the fun contrarian opinion to have that Persona 5 doesn't deserve all of the praise and success that it has received, but I think that these smaller details and storytelling told through visual and design choices make up a solid thematic throughline that makes the game feel not only visually entertaining, but rich in symbolism and subtext that reinforces the core aspects of the narrative. I understand that these elements may not be for everyone, but they certainly appeal to me. And if you're watching this video, then they probably appeal to you too. Suffice it to say that I don't think anything in Persona 5 was done frivolously or without careful consideration. From the boss fights to the enemy choice, everything in the game is designed to reference the core themes, and no theme gets more attention than perhaps the most important one, Rebellion. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video. If you made it this far, then you probably liked what I had to say. If that's the case, be sure to leave me a like so I know I'm doing something right. Be sure to comment below on what themes or personas you want me to talk about in the future. Also, at the time of uploading this video, we have just passed 2,000 subscribers. So, first of all, thank you so much for that. I love each and every one of you guys, whether you just subbed today or you've been around since the beginning. And second off, if you're new around here, feel free to subscribe. You can always change your mind later, and best of all, it's absolutely free. Finally, I also have a Twitter and an Instagram if you would like to hit me up on either of those platforms. Links will be below. But with all that YouTube stuff out of the way, I just want to say thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.